Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm Georgiana Romero. Um, on behalf of the VLS Environmental Law Society, we're very proud to introduce the first panel, um, Environmental Laws and Disclosure Requirements, and our moderator, Professor Pat Parento. So we're all here to find out about the truth, right? But remember what that great philosopher, Jack Nicholson, said. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. It's my pleasure to introduce one of the really all-star panels, I think, uh, that could have been assembled. And uh, Ariel and Anna deserve an incredible amount of uh, thanks and uh, recognition for the tireless efforts. When, when they first suggested the scope of this conference, I told them they were crazy. They couldn't possibly pull it off, but obviously I was wrong. So uh, the lineup that you see in the program and that you see arrayed before you on the panel is the lineup that we're going to follow uh, today. So let me just very quickly, as we said, we're not going to read their biographies. It would take the whole 85 minutes to do that. Uh, but I do want to at least indicate who we have with us today. Shaqeb Afsa is an environmental economist. Um, he's got an incredible uh, international and global uh, experience uh, centered around the idea of public disclosure. He's currently uh, the CEO of Performix uh, uh, Corporation in uh, Maryland. Yeah. Um, then we have Professor Mark Cohen from Vanderbilt uh, University. He holds joint appointments at the business school and the law school. Um, has also done a lot of work with Resources for the Future and EPA. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Katrina Ku, sorry, um, who is uh, Associate Professor of Law at Hofstra. Uh, she teaches a, a variety of environmental courses. She's also co-editor of the Law of uh, Adaptation to Climate Change and, and had the unhappy task of being the editor on a chapter that I wrote for that book. Thankfully, Katrina managed to pull it into shape so that it at least was presentable. Uh, Matt McFeely, uh, we have, for a staff attorney with Natural Resources Defense Council, heads up their land and wildlife program, does a lot of work on hydraulic fracturing. Um, and then Shai Sahai, uh, who is an associate with uh, Arnold and Porter in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, his work uh, focuses on chemicals uh, across a wide uh, swath of federal law, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, TSCA, and all those other acronyms. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Shikab to start us off. I'll sit down here like Jim Lehrer and uh, moderate this thing and hopefully come up with some more intelligent questions uh, than Jim managed to do. Uh, and we have about 80-some minutes for this panel. Uh, after brief remarks, five minutes or so for each panelist, I'll ask a few impertinent questions. And then after that, we'll open it up for more general discussion. So go ahead. Uh, thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction and for setting up this, uh, this stage for uh, uh, starting off with uh, uh, what I think would be a very interesting discussion on environmental disclosure. Uh, just to uh, uh, give a very quick introduction, this work that I'm going to talk about, the international perspective, it really originated in 1993 when I was at the World Bank in the research department, not in the operations department. And we were very frustrated with the non-performance we observed in the environmental regulatory systems in developing countries. So there was rampant pollution, laws existed, but nothing was getting enforced. And we thought TRI, the, the Toxic Release Inventory Program and Community Right to Know uh, principle thinking provided a good approach to initiate an you know, sort of alternative ways to, uh, to tackle environmental issues in developing countries. But you'll see it, it has evolved into a slightly different idea. So I've structured this in, uh, you know, six, seven quick sections, so let me get started. Uh, environmental disclosure in developing countries, it's, it's not really rooted in community right to know like the TRI. It has evolved to become a process of the overall environmental regulatory structure. So you typically have the EIA, which gives you the permit to construct and operate your business. Then you issue permits, which uh, uh, entitle you to, to, to perform, but on certain conditions. And then you have inspections, compliance, and enforcement. What happened was steps three, four, and five were just not happening. 
And so environmental disclosure, the way it has evolved is it has become a step in that chain, in that regulatory process chain. And the core objective is to change environmental outcomes through compliance and enforcement of standards. Um, community right to know disclosure is important, but the real focus is on changing environmental um, uh, outcomes. So at that point, there were like a couple of options, three options, you know, whether to disclose raw data like the TRI, or whether to disclose, uh, you know, whether it is uh, good to disclose just aggregated data or ratings, as was in the case of the financial sectors, Moody's financial ratings, or disclose both. What happened in the case of uh, Indonesia, where this program started first, they said, well, you know, if we disclose that a factory is releasing some toxics, next thing you know is these villagers would go and burn down the factory. So there would be extreme reactions. So they said, we'll come up with a rating scheme based on colors, which are easy to communicate, and they basically communicate performance, uh, compliance performance based on, you know, excellent, very good to poor and weak. We also found that there was considerable political resistance to disclosure of raw data. And so it was easier to sell the idea of color codes and ratings rather than allowing, you know, pushing for raw data disclosure. And th it was acceptable politically because you could link it to enforcement and regulations. So they said, look, the country has already passed the law, it's a standard, so you know, we should uh, connect it to that. And it was also favored by the media and, uh, and NGOs. And then there we came up with a big methodology to transform raw data into these colors. And uh, the key guiding principle was, you know, the overall performance is only as good as the weakest link, so that there is no issue of weights and trade-offs and this and that. So that was the approach that has worked pretty much in most countries. Oops. Uh, this is the, the typical way disclosure happens. This is an example of disclosure in Ghana, which just happened last week. There are names of companies, there's final rating, and then they also disclose ratings in six different areas. So it's pretty, you know, uh, kind of easy to understand. In the case of Indonesia, they only disclose the final ratings. Detailed raw data only goes to companies for their internal purposes. So that's not disclosed to the general public. So that's the method, that's the content of disclosure. Uh, what was the objective? It was really an interesting strategy. The, they view environmental pollution management as a political issue in developing countries. So they said, we need to use disclosure to build our relationship with NGOs, communities, media, and businesses. And with businesses, they said, businesses are generally against environmental disclosure. So we will make sure that there are some business entities which are good, which get a green and a blue rating, so that they will be on our side. And that's how they got the buy-in of the business. So there was a political strategy associated with this whole disclosure approach, which was really driven, originated from a political end. Uh, we have had cases in about eight countries. You know, the, the ones which are marked in blue are the countries where I've been involved directly. Uh, in many countries, uh, it started, but it didn't take roots. So what we have learned is disclosure requires considerable amount of information readiness. We shouldn't take it for granted. And institutional readiness. So it's very easy to start because media gets interested in it, but it's very difficult to sustain it and ensure that they're sustained. You know. Then we did some research in Indonesia to find out how is this information really changing outcomes. And what was most interesting and has shaped my thinking a lot on this is we found that information that goes to companies that's of the most value. And the ratings that are disclosed to the public was not as important. And if companies got informed by regulators about their performance in a very detailed manner, that itself motivated a lot of changes, and which led me to start to think about, do we need internal, dis is internal disclosure sufficient to change outcomes, or do we really need to disclose this raw data also? given that there are political barriers to disclosing raw data. So this is an interesting question which we hope would be of discussion. But we know that ratings, aggregate information, was good enough to cut pollution. In Indonesia, increased compliance. In Indonesia, without a single court case. So just disclosure of ratings, colors, led to such a significant improvement in compliance. Same thing we are observing now in Ghana. Exactly the same trend. Okay. And then, you know, it has been recognized by different uh, uh, internationally. 
But the most interesting result we got was that disclosure not only disciplined companies, but it also disciplined regulators. Because there is tremendous pressure that regulators felt about data, data quality, because they were disclosing information. So they were not only scrutinizing the performance of companies, but they were also disclosing their own performance in many ways. So that disciplined regulators in developing countries and had a huge impact on environmental performance. Some responses. Industries, they resisted in the beginning. They, they want to kill it. In Ghana, in 2010, when we did the first disclosure, suddenly there was a letter in the vice president's office to kill the program. And we had to justify stay up all night, and we went ahead with it. Same thing in Indonesia. But once they got into two or three cycles, industries begin, began to realize that, oh, this is actually good for us. Because nobody believes us if we do good environmental management. But if regulators disclose the same information, it is of tremendous value in terms you know, for, bank, for the bankers, investors. And so industries, I'm convinced they can buy into disclosure. NGOs was the most interesting reaction. We thought NGOs in developing countries would love this. Actually, what has happened is the opposite. In Indonesia, they want to kill the program. And here is the reason. What happened was in Indonesia, NGOs heavily focus on the mining sector. And they don't want mining operations to exist. Okay? But once mining operations are there, and NGOs have been targeting mining companies for a long time, they were facing tremendous pressure. And what we found that they were the first ones to improve. And as a result, we find that the average compliance level is 66% in the country, but in the mining sector, it's 85%. <clears throat> so it has muted a lot of NGO activism, and they don't like it. They want to just kill this program. The media, uh, yeah. And then, you know, just to sum up, you know, so, so we have found a variety of reactions. What we can sum up now is environmental disclosure works well in developing countries when it is closely linked to regulations, command and control in this case. It's really a method of enforcement before you take the hard you know, uh, you know, path, which is to go through the court system, which is extremely expensive. You can get quite a bit of enforcement achieved just through disclosure. So that's really important. The second one is, is you know, favored by governments because it empowers governments. Governments generally look for rules and regulations. In this case, they found that information is power for them because they can analyze it, they really understand operations, so they, and it changed their entire negotiating you know, environment with companies. Uh, NGOs, I'm still wondering where they stand on this. Uh, disclosure has improved governance in public agencies, but disclosure has also improved the quality of environmental data, which is quite important. That in the first round, when you do it, it's, they scramble over the place to get the data, but because these, these data are disclosed, it puts tremendous pressure on everybody involved to get the data right. And I still believe that in the TRI case, where there was a huge improvement in the first few years, we just don't know how much of it was because data quality improved. You know, how much of it was there was a real change, we really don't know. But in our experience, we found that there's a tremendous improvement in the quality of data, which then can be leveraged, leveraged for other purposes. But most important of all, from, from the broader disclosure perspective, we find that we can achieve a lot of environmental improvement without disclosing the detailed raw data to the entire public. So if the focus is on environmental outcomes, it's, it's not clear in my head whether we need to disclose this detailed raw data or not. Just the ratings is good enough. And the detailed data goes <clears throat> directly to internally, privately to companies. So let me just end my presentation with, on that note. Thank you. Thank you. That was an interesting talk to follow, and I, I want you to know for the, uh, I don't know if you all realize, but Keb is really a pioneer in this field, and I, he and I haven't met, but we've sort of been exchanging uh, citations of each other's work for many, many years, and sort of the old timers on disclosure. Um, and the work he's talking about, he just talked about, really is pioneering work, and it's being cited and used everywhere around the world. So really quite interesting. And, it, and the marrying of real policy with real research, which is what he's done, uh, you oftentimes see policy folks who really don't understand and don't really do re real research and vice versa. But this is a rather unique case. Well, I've been asked to look at a, at, at a much more detailed question, and that is greenhouse gas emissions. Can disclosure in any fashion 
um, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, coming back to the, the, the Dean's earlier comments, uh, I don't think anybody thinks of this as a substitute. It's a complement to, uh, to potential regulation of other forms. But the key question that, that I want to address is, what's the potential? Does it really have any value in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So very quickly, and I'm, I, this is sort of at a very high level I want to go through because I don't have a lot of time and we want to open up for questions. There's an awful lot of stakeholder pressures that, that firms are, are faced with these days. Customers, shareholders, governments, NGOs, the community, um, shareholders more and more are asking questions about greenhouse gases. So these kinds of things, firms are feeling this all the time right now. And when you start to ask about disclosure, um, and, and the broad theme of disclosure that we're going to talk about throughout the day, um, I wanted to, to just show you that, and highlight the fact that there's so many different kinds of disclosure. And I just put this up as an example. So if you, if you take a look, there's everything from voluntary to mandatory. Uh, and a lot of disclosure programs are purely voluntary. They're not being pushed, not being mandated by the government. And there's things in between. There are a lot of partnerships where government, for example, is the one who certifies and runs a program, but it's still a voluntary program. Energy Star is an example of that. Uh, there's quasi-regulatory programs in between, which is, you know, SEC requires certain types of disclosure if you want, if they're material. Federal Trade Commission on, on consumer labels uh, will, ha will have uh, policies in place on deceptive advertising, those sorts of things. So the government gets involved at various levels. So we start from pure voluntary all the way down to pure uh, ma mandatory. And then I want to talk very briefly about both <clears throat> facility or corporate level disclosure and then product level disclosure. Because again, those are different things, but they're all different forms of disclosure. Um, so you can see there's a vast variety of different types of disclosure programs that, are, that could be out there. So let me just start very quickly with the TRI, the mandatory disclosure, and what do we know about it? What I want to tell you about is what do we know about from research about uh, these kinds of disclosure programs and what might it mean for greenhouse gas disclosure. So uh, TRI, which many of you should know about, community right to know laws, I don't think anybody in this room probably doesn't know about this. Um, clearly this is a program that's been studied a lot. What we found was after TRI numbers came out, firms reduced their, their, um, their emissions. Now as Jacob said, maybe that's, some of that's better data quality. At least from, the, the, from what we know, they have been reduced. And there's anecdotal reasons, and you hear a lot of it, having to do with the fact that companies simply didn't want to be the, known as the worst violators. Corporate CEOs would, would personally tell you, I was shocked, I had no idea, and they, they ordered their companies to do something about it. So I mean, there's lots of reasons why. Uh, was there community pressure? There really was community pressure. So we can think about those various stakeholders. There were lots of different pressures uh, that were brought to bear. There's evidence on the Safe Drinking Water Act, when communities were required to post um, the content of their drinking water, and whether, they were, whether the drinking water had passed standards or not. Uh, we found, there some studies found reductions in, uh, in contaminants in drinking water, so improvement in drinking water, once the community was told what their drinking water quality was. Um, it forced municipal uh, governments to improve water quality. Um, at the state level, there's been some evidence on renewable uh, portfolios uh, showing that when, again, when consumers in their bills are told the mix of, of uh, the sources of electricity, that there was, an, there was pressure on utilities to use more renewables. Okay? So there is evidence that this kind of uh, disclosure has had an impact. The mechanisms, however, are not entirely clear, and that's what researchers are working on quite a bit. And I don't, we'll talk about that in Q&A if you want. Now, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, EPA recently required greenhouse gas uh, emission re requirements, or reporting requirement, as you may know, uh, facility level reporting. Will external pressure um, prompt reductions? I think, I think the answer is only a little. Um, that's my guess. I mean, this is more of a guess. I've started to study it. I will tell you that, from what I can tell, there was not the kind of media disclosure as there was with TRI, partly because some of this was already known, but it just didn't seem to have the impact. Now, whether that w that's just a conjecture, I don't know, um, and I think time will tell. It does have the potential if there are pressures similar to what we saw with TRI. So if those stakeholders start to put pressure on firms, uh, and yes, there are some internal pressures because nobody wants to be known as the worst, and, and companies want it, firms benchmark against their competitors. 
Uh, and so there is some of that pressure going on. Uh, but, but again, I, whether this will have that same impact, and we can talk about why later, it may not have the same impact as TRI, uh, but there is this potential in a very similar manner. Well, let me go to the very other direction, which is on the voluntary side. And so uh, you may be familiar with things like the Global Reporting Initiative, the Carbon Disclosure Project, which are voluntary, but yet firms, the majority of large global firms, publicly traded firms, are disclosing. They're disclosing their carbon emissions. Not quite scope three yet, but they're, but they're, they're disclosing their carbon emissions. Uh, why? Again, because of these pressures. And there's institutionalized pressures because carbon disclosure project, GRI, and things like this. So there's a lot of pressure for this. And then when you start getting ranked, if you go to CDP, you'll find out who are the biggest emitters, who are the best emitters, who are the leaders. Companies care about that. And so the pressures on companies are there. Now let me very quickly move to the product labeling side. Um, and most of this has been voluntary, although a lot of it has been at the public-private partnership level. So let me talk very briefly about carbon footprints. First of all, as you may know, there's a plethora, there's so many f labels, and that's part of the problem, is there's confusion out there, and there will be continued confusion. Uh, and so it's not just carbon footprint, there's all kinds of things uh, that you see. Dolphin Safe, Ford Stewardship Council, Energy Star, all kinds of things, organic, fair trade, on and on and on. And we'll talk later on dur during uh, the session today about other types of labeling. That's a problem because as you have more and more labels, there's more confusion. I wanted to just show you one, one uh, example of a public-private partnership. This is in Japan. Interestingly enough, the first uh, voluntary uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, companies to agree to, to do this uh, test with the Japanese government were the, the beer makers. Why beer makers? I don't know. It was maybe to, to, because they wanted to shift the, the focus away from alcohol. I don't know. Uh, but they were the ones who came out with, with the first, uh, uh. now here's the label. What do you think about it? I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but here's the label. 123 grams of CO2. <laughs> All right, we, we can do a Jan did. How many think that's good? <laughs> How many think that's bad? I don't have a clue. Neither do you. Uh, very effective label. I, and I was actually in Japan two years ago, and I, and I tried to explain to them this is not the way to go. I don't know, if they, they obviously didn't listen to me. Uh, you need to have some context. Anyways, the point is that these things are very complex. This is a whole science behind you know, what, what's, the, what's the communication vehicle uh, that, that Shaked was talking about earlier. But, but this is what's happening now in Japan. Um, so will carbon footprint labels work? Well, I don't know, but I will say very briefly that, that in theory they provide a competition to be the low carbon supplier. And I've written about this quite a bit. I think there's a lot of value in thinking about carbon f product labeling. Um, and that provides this pressure for, for, you know, for consumers to choose products, to pressure uh, um, suppliers uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. And it also, I think, pr provides a pretty interesting incentive. If we're here in the United States and we start to label our products, for example, it provides an incentive for the non x one country, for, country, for company, companies that are manufacturing products in China to export to the United States, it provides an incentive for them to reduce, even if they don't have regulations, laws requiring it. Uh, so, and that may spill over to their domestic production. So um, my last slide, actually, is, is um, probably somewhat of a downer. Uh, you may know about Tesco. Tesco is a supermarket in, in the UK which came out a few years ago saying we're going to lab carbon label every product we sell. Hundreds of thousands, I mean how many grocery stores, how many, hundreds of thousands, good luck. Well they started and they finally just this last year gave it up. They said it's too costly to implement, we aren't getting enough consumer demand, but more important the competitors weren't following, they thought others would follow. Um, and so what I think that suggests is a need, first of all, for public-private partnerships. There needs to be a scale to this. You can't expect one company to implement it themselves. There needs to be an industry-wide initiative. But the other thing, and this is what I'm starting to look at now, is how do you prioritize? You can't just say, let's lab label 700,000 products. Maybe down the road that will happen, but you've got to figure out what will have the most impact, first of all, in terms of carbon reduction. Where are the opportunities for reduction? Where is competition likely to take place? Where will consumers care? And what has the most likely impact? And focus your attention on, on priority products. That hasn't happened, but I think if that happens, um, there's a lot of promise for, um, for carbon labeling as a, as a way for um, carbon reductions. 
So that's it, and I'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Are you going next? Do you want to go next? I don't know. They have us. I took you off that slide, TRI. <laughs> I, shouldn't have, I should have left it in. <laughs> So um, I come at this from a slightly different perspective, um, which is um, I'm interested in how we might target environmental disclosure to individuals, both as an audience and a subject. Um, in that respect, thinking about individuals as an audience, um, disclosure by industry to the public is certainly a part of that. But I would think of that as a subset of a larger project of how we might use law to better communicate to individuals about how environmental degradation harms them. Similarly, with respect to thinking about individuals as a subject of disclosure, my starting point is that there are many individual behaviors that, when aggregated, impose significant environmental harms that, in some instances, rival or exceed those of industry. And what I'm interested in is how we might use law to better reveal and understand the connection between individual behavior um, and environmental harms. And to take a step back, since my perspective is quite uh, is a little bit different in terms of how we might use environmental disclosure, um, why is it that I'm interested in focusing, focusing on individuals? And there are really two, um, two reasons. The first is um, individuals really are an important source and a growing source of environmental harms um, in relation to commercial and industrial sources of harms. Um, so you might have heard an off-cited um, um, statistic that individuals and households are responsible uh, for about 30 to 40 percent of carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. Uh, but that estimate counts only direct emissions. Um, so if you think about driving a car, the direct emissions would be the emissions coming from the tailpipe. Um, but uh, if you extend that out and incorporate indirect emissions, so for example, consider include in the person with respect to the person driving the car the embodied emissions to produce, manufacture, and transport the car, um, by some estimates using this kind of consumer lifestyle approach, um, individuals and, and their lifestyles account for about 85% of all energy use in the United States and about 102% of U.S. emissions. Now that statistic uh, might suggest something fishy is going on with the numbers, uh, but what it really reflects is the emissions embodied in goods that we, uh, that we import. Um, so my one, one argument for focusing uh, environmental disclosure on individuals is that individuals are really um, an important source of harm, a source of harm that our um, existing regulatory scheme doesn't um, often uh, address itself to. Uh, and the second rationale is that individuals are also an incredibly important repository of political will. And to again use an example of climate change, I think we often hear um, the climate change, the failure of federal climate change legislation on Capitol Hill is often ascribed to uh, lobbying by um, uh, large energy uh, and oil companies. Um, however, if you, if you scrape under the surface of that, in terms of defining the universe of the possible, um, proposals like carbon taxes are often dismissed as dead on arrival uh, because of the perceived, because of, I think, the real perception um, that U.S. consumers would be unwilling to accept direct increases in the price of energy. Um, so what I want to turn to think about is first individuals as audience and then individuals as um, um, as the subject of disclosure regulation and think about some of the challenges um, when we try to apply disclosure um, and target individuals with disclosure. Um, so first of all, thinking about individuals as audience, um, my sense is that the public, we are all um, affected in negative ways by environmental degradation um, every day and throughout our lives, but we're largely unaware of it. So for example, very conservative estimates suggest that there are 10,000 cancer cases each year in the United States associated with environmental exposures. Um, when I um, go through with my classes, just to give you a couple of anecdotes that I think illustrate this ignorance, um, when I go through with my environmental law classes, I just, you know, put up the TRI data uh, for Nassau County where we live. Students are absolutely shocked, <laughs> absolutely shocked to discover. Uh, when I put up, um, inform them that we live in a non-attainment area for ozone, something they have no, um, no concept of. Um, and to make that a little more um, concrete, um, I was on a, a um, I'm on a listserv for parents in, in Brooklyn, and, and one mother posted a question. She was thinking about buying an apartment. She had a newborn, and she was her concern with the apartment was right by the BQE, and she had some kind of sense that maybe there was a problem with air quality. So I responded to her, and I forwarded her to her the studies about you know, California requiring um, setbacks or buffer zones between um, major roadways and schools of up to 1,000 feet and some of the associated health impacts. But thinking about that kind of issue, um, if we think about individuals as audience, um, you can imagine if we somehow 
everyone got a printout at the end of the day or the end of the year. Um, here's how environmental degradation impacted you today, or here is your increased risk of cancer as a result of all the exposures um, that you had um, this year, um, uh, how that might, um, how effective that might be um, in terms of um, educating. Uh, individuals. There are, however, a variety of challenges. So, for example, that printout I've suggested to you is clearly uh, beyond our current administrative uh, scientific and technical capabilities. However, I'm not without hope in this regard. So, a few years ago, there were um, some NYU graduate students who developed a T-shirt with a pair of lungs on the front that actually, when you wore it, changed color as you went uh, based on the ambient level of air pollution um, in the um, areas that you went into. They have kids in the Bronx running around with little um, air monitors on, um, which is part of the way that they're actually figuring out what, what is the actual level of environmental or um, air pollution pollutants that children in the Bronx um, are exposed to. So my thought, my, my hope is that at least with respect to the administrative feasibility of this or the idea of is there any possible way that we could better communicate to individuals the way that a degraded environment impacts them, I think there, there, there are some reasons to think that the challenges um, are decreasing. Um, I think another significant challenge, however, is with respect to thinking about um, individuals. Um, when we target disclosure to companies, companies are, tend to be reassuringly rational in ways that individuals are, are beautifully sometimes, but sometimes catastrophically not. Um, so if you think about um, risk perception and relative risk, something I've, I've kind of toyed with is this idea of, um, gee, what if um, you provided with people with every bill of sale you're moving into this home. Here is a one-page sheet that summarizes for you uh, the relevant um, environmental kind of conditions or um, ramifications of choosing to live in this home that would reflect, for example, whether you're in an attainment area, how close you are to a major, uh, a major roadway, um, and the like. But of course, the problem with some kind of environmental health disclosure of that sort, and you can imagine the effect that might have on property values and incentives people have to clean up their environment. Um, but the, the concern that I would have about that is that, of course, environmental risks um, are only one of many risks that we face. So, for example, in an urban environment, you might well be in an unattainment area for an air pollutant, but you might live a much healthier lifestyle because you walk instead of drive. Um, so trying to sort that out, I think, can be challenging. And finally, I think there are a whole host of sociological and psychological factors that come into play when we think about trying to communicate information um, to individuals. Uh, and I think um, Professor Cohen already talked about the concept of label fatigue and figuring out how to design a label in a way that communicates effectively and achieves the desired response um, is enormously complex. Um, I'm also interested in individuals and subject. So in other words, how can we use environmental law and policy to reveal how individuals harm the environment? Um, and what interests me in this, um, we, it's sometimes stunning to me the general ignorance that uh, we have about the way that our lifestyles impact the environment. Richard Lazarus has characterized the age we live on as one uh, where we have a, a cognitive severance of environmental effect, or in other words, we are largely ignorant of the ecological cons consequences of our daily activities because we are so removed um, from our sources of food, energy, and natural sources. Betsy Taylor and Dave Tilford say, we participate in environmental degradations of monumental proportions in a completely anonymous and unconscious fashion. Um, so what are some examples of ways that we might better communicate to individuals about the way that their behaviors impact um, on the environment? So examples include um, so great, fun new technologies like smart meters that do a better job of communicating to individuals with greater uh, fine-grained nuance about how they're consuming energy in the home. You might imagine um, that lovely GPS report you get you know, about your car's efficiency. Well, wouldn't it be great if it told you, um, here are the behaviors you engaged in behind the wheel, your level of acceleration, et cetera, and the amount of gas you wasted as a result. You could even imagine in this day and age, if we're interested in building social norms, that report could even communicate with other cars and communicate to you, this is how wasteful your driving was compared to the 10,000 the 10, other people on the road with you this morning. Um, and a variety of, a number of scholars have proposed a variety of ways that we might help individuals understand their impact in the environment, everything from uh, carbon labeling to uh, a suggestion that the government might administer a national environmental census requiring individual self-assessment of household environmental impact. Again here, we run into similar administrative, scientific, and technical constraints. It would be great if at the end of the year I got a printout that said, uh, characterized in, in wonderful detail, um, all of the things that I did and the effects um, that they had on the environment. 
Um, we're far from being able to do that, but again, technology, I think, is helpful in this regard. So there are some communities, for example, that are using uh, ra radio frequency identification tags in garbage bins to track um, how much garbage people are throwing away, how well they are um, separating their recycling and the like. Um, so what are some of the other concerns that this raises? And this brings me, I think, fits in very nicely with Professor Milne's opening. There, um, remarks to you, there are some significant privacy concerns that these can raise. And already in some communities, utilities have um, adopted opt-out policies with respect to the installation of smart meters, driven in part uh, by concerns that people have about uh, the privacy um, harms that smart meters <coughs> impose. Um, there are also a host of sociological and psychological considerations in this context as well. So for example, uh, if you're thinking about how do people decide um, what they, the norms that they should conform their behavior to. It turns out that there really is a herd mentality. Um, and if we reveal information that a lot of people are routinely behaving in really environmentally destructive ways, that actually might make us feel like, well, it's okay because I'm doing what everybody else is doing. Um, so a lot of care needs to be taken in terms of how you communicate information um, to individuals. Um, and finally, there are, when we think about um, in the context of the First Amendment, some constraints related to compelled commercial speech, uh, and also uh, some trade law considerations when we start thinking about trying to empower people as consumers uh, that we might have to consider. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks. Um, I'm Matt McFeely. I'm at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and um, like Professor Cohen, I'm sort of uh, was assigned to do a little bit of a deep dive into a specific topic, and that is hydraulic fracturing disclosure laws. Um, so I'm with only five minutes up here. I don't have time to sort of get into the too much about what fracking is and all that sort of thing. I'm hoping that you all have some basic knowledge. Um, the, I did want to talk a little bit about sort of what's in fracking fluid and why might we be concerned that it be disclosed. Um, so fracking fluid is generally composed of water, um, a propant, which can be either sand or a synthetic sand-like material or sometimes a sand coated in a resins or those kinds of things, which are there to prop open the fractures that are created um, in the oil and gas formation. And then we have chemicals, which can make up most Estimates I've seen are somewhere between half a percent and two percent of um, those fracking fluids. Um, with a six million gallon frac job, which is not uncommon in a lot of um, areas, that can mean anywhere between 30,000 and um, 120,000 gallons of chemicals are being used in a given well. So while it's a low percentage um, of those fluids, it, um, those chemicals often are large in volume. Um, those chemicals can be uh, serve a wide range of purposes. So they may be there to adjust the pH of the fluid. They may be there to kill uh, biocides, to kill bacteria in the well bore. They may be there as corrosion inhibitors, um, as um, surfactants to sort of help dissolve the various fluids that are being put together. Um, but they, many of them, are hazardous. Um, there are known and probable carcinogens in, um, that we know are being used in fracking, endocrine, endocrine disruptors, um, and then many um, that would be um, hazardous, and certainly when they come back out of the well bore, they would be listed as hazardous waste if it weren't for um, exemptions in federal laws. So um, I thought I would give a little bit of a sort of sense of where we are with fracking disclosure now. Um, this, I, so there are sort of three major aspects of a fracking disclosure rule, and I'm talking about mandatory disclosure rules. Um, there are, is sort of the timing of the disclosure, whether it happens both before and after fracturing or only afterwards, um, and when that occurs. Um, there's the sort of content of the chemical disclosure itself, and then there's um, the question of trade secrets um, and what exemptions are provided. Um, so this map should give you a sense, um, and we'll run through a few of these, um, the sort of various state laws that exist in the area. Um, 
fracking is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act, and so there isn't a federal law which requires disclosure. The red states are states where we know there has been fracking, but where there is no disclosure rule. Um, it's, I, I have to say where we know there has been fracking because, because uh, fracking has been exempted from federal laws like the Safe Drinking Water Act, we actually don't know. There may be other states where fracking has occurred, um, but these are the ones we have evidence of. Um, <clears throat> so the red states have fracking but no rule, and there are 10 of those. Um, the states then in um, orange have a rule but no requirement for pre-disclosure, and then the yellow states are states where some pre-disclosure is required. Unfortunately, you can't really see that there are four, there are four light blue states. The light blue isn't, I don't know how well you all can see that, but th that is different. The, those are the better states. California, Wyoming, Arkansas, and Illinois um, are states where there's a robust pre-disclosure requirement that all chemicals be disclosed. Now, pre-disclosure is important for a number of reasons. It's important so that emergency response plans can be made. Um, it's important so that regulators can evaluate whether these chemicals pose a hazard. Um, and it's imp important for ba uh, things like baseline testing so that contamination can be traced to its source. Um, states do better on chemical identification requirements. So um, the states in light blue are those states where, um, where states require that all chemicals that are being put down a well be disclosed to the public um, and that their chemical I identification numbers also be provided. Um, those states that you see in yellow have only some uh, chemicals are required to be disclosed, generally those that are considered hazardous under OSHA laws, um, which is kind of a weird, um, I think it's sort of trying to fit a, a square peg in a round hole. Um, but since there, it, it was an existing law about what, when certain ke chemicals are hazardous, it happens to be in the workplace context. Um, a number of states have adopted that as deciding these are chemicals that are hazardous. Now we think that there are plenty of other chemicals which present hazards which are not classified as hazardous under the OSHA rules because they haven't been studied in a workplace context or they provide um, or they pose hazards that wouldn't necessarily um, come up in a workplace context like drinking water contamination. Um, unfortunately the trade secret um, space is where a lot of states sort of allow some of the exceptions to swallow the rule. Um, only a few states require that trade secrets be, um, that there be any justification of those trade secrets. Um, so in, in all the states that you see in orange, um, companies can unilaterally withhold um, information as a trade secret without any justification um, whatsoever. Um, a few states require uh, basically an affirmation um, where you check a few boxes, sign a form, and affirm that your chemical is a trade secret. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't give the public any way of, um, or the regulator, um, any way of checking those claims. Um, and then if, then there are, there are just a, a handful of states, three, that require actual justification of those trade secret claims and that do some evaluation. Both uh, Illinois and California's rules have just very recently passed, so we haven't seen those implemented yet. Um, Wyoming has been sued over their implementation of their rule that they're um, evaluating these trade secret claims on the basis that they're not actually looking very hard at the claims. Um, so I think, um, there are sort of three lessons from the fracking context that apply more generally in uh, to disclosure issues as a whole. One, I think, is that the devil is really in the details here. Um, there, the disclosure has been really trumpeted by the oil and gas industry as a success story. Um, the fact that all these state laws have been passed that require disclosure, but when you drill into these rules, uh, often the substance of the disclosure is not all that robust. And so, um, so it's not just important that we have disclosure, but that the right things are being disclosed, that there are real requirements that trade secrets be justified, um, and that the disclosure is made in a timely fashion such that 
it is useful to people. Um, I think the second lesson that I see is that um, advocates of disclosure really need to think bigger. The debate around hydraulic fracturing disclosure has really been defined quite narrowly um, to mean chemicals involved in the hydraulic fracturing process. There are many chemicals that are used in the oil and gas industry in general. Um, in other uh, stages of the exploration process that are not required for disclosure in many of these states, and very few states have even looked at, at disclosure of those chemicals, which are also trucked through communities and um, used on site, and many of which are also injected into the ground near folks drinking water. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> so uh, there are other chemicals and then there are other aspects of the hydraulic fracturing process that may be really important in certain areas. Out west, um, water use can be one of the biggest impacts that we see from hydraulic fracturing. Um, if, you know, where wells are going dry, if lots of fresh water is being used in hydraulic fracturing, for instance, that may be just as important to disclose. <clears throat> and then the third um, thing is that information is not sort of equivalent to people being able to interpret it and I think that's been touched on by a couple of panelists but um, I was recently talking to a public health expert who mentioned that um, one of the things that we've pushed really hard for at NRDC is to make sure that medical professionals um, and emergency responders have trade secret information in an emergency or if they need it to treat a patient um, or diagnose someone um, and you know they pointed out often these people may get chemical information. They may, a doctor may not know what the effects of a given chemical are. And so even for specialists, um, that information may be difficult to interpret. They may not know, they, you know, if they're not a trained toxicologist, they may not know about the interaction of chemicals and what those effects might be. Um, so I think we need to do more to help people interpret the information. And certainly from the public's perspective, um, in order, for disclosure to really bear fruit and derive innovation towards better products um, that are safer. Um, the public needs to know, is the stuff being injected in the well near my house any worse than the stuff being injected up the road? Um, if I'm gonna sign a lease with a gas company to frack on my land, are there things that are particularly dangerous that, that I don't want them to use? Um, so I think those are the types of concerns that have been brought up well, but that we need to do better in the fracking context. Great. Well, I've been asked uh, to speak about the regula regulated industry perspective on disclosure issues. And I think there's often a caricature out there that uh, the regulated industry is, uh, by default, anti-disclosure. Um, and I, I want to dispel that notion uh, first off. Um, the reality is that businesses value disclosure quite highly and that they balance, when thinking about disclosure, a lot of the same factors that society uh, as a whole balances. So you might ask, what, you know, it, it seems, it may seem obvious uh, why businesses want to withhold everything. So what are the benefits of disclosure for businesses? <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I feel like the number one thing is that businesses and, 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 and my clients included among them generally really believe in their products. And my clients really do. My clients don't want to put out products that are terrible for the environment, that are uh, leaching uh, and harming humans uh, or animals or, or other aspects of environmental values. Uh, and, and that's, I think, generally true of uh, many, if not most, companies today. Second is that we want uh, the public to believe in our products as much as we do. Uh, so the, another huge benefit of disclosure is if you take it uh, that it's true that uh, you know companies do, do uh, care about their products, then you would also want other people to have enough information to come to the same conclusions that you do uh, about how your products may affect the environment uh, or human health. Uh, and Third, an another huge benefit of uh, disclosure for us is to the extent there's a misunderstanding, 
that a regulated industry might have about the nature of a certain chemical and its environmental effects, uh, disclosure can help bring that misunderstanding to the forefront quickly uh, and help us deal with that problem. And to the extent, uh, you know, there's learning about the nature of a chemical that uh, companies or regulated entities didn't have before, uh, they can come up to speed and, if necessary, uh, make adjustments in the products or pull products off the market. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, those are all the positive things that I think businesses, uh, uh, or some of the positive things that businesses think about when they're thinking about disclosure issues. Of course, that's not the full story. Uh, like I said, there's, you know, balancing of interests that go on when companies think about disclosure. And uh, one significant interest that companies have the other way are trade secrets, which uh, some of my other co-panelists have thought about. Uh, and I think when thinking about trade secrets, I think it's important to understand that, uh, that trade secrets and the concept of them are, I think, part of the, en uh, the engine of innovation that makes America come up with re really great products that it can spread to the rest of the world. Um, companies put a lot of thinking into uh, their products and how they're formulated. And if you take away uh, protections for the contents of their products, I really do think that uh, innovation would go down. And I know, uh, you know the majority of my clients uh, feel the same way. Um, and so there's, you know, that innate, this, this kind of tension that um, companies themselves, even excluding other stakeholders, are always thinking about when they think about disclosure, which is we want people to understand our, our products and know that they're as good as we think they are. On the other hand, we want to protect the, you know, uh, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in, of investments we've put into developing this product. Um, and that, so this debate isn't only happening, you know, with nonprofits versus industry, it's happening within industry as well. The second issue, which again my colleagues have already touched on, that I think is a significant negative, or uh, yeah, drawback uh, of, of disclosure requirements, or can be, is that uh, there can be the misunderstanding of information uh, that goes out to the public. Uh, and I'll give you uh, an example. Uh, let's say that there's a chemical uh, that's a component of, of some product, and there is a, uh, a scientific study that's done uh, by, that's maybe not the most reputable scientific study, but it alleges that the product uh, or chemical is, a, is carcinogenic. It gets out in the newspaper, it's all over the papers. Subsequently, there's a National Academy Science of Sciences report that says that, in fact, this chemical is not a carcinogen. Uh, does it matter that the NAS did a review and found out that this chemical is not a carcinogen? Probably not. Once the chemical is in the newspapers and the allegations are out there, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the, there's going to be tremendous pressure on industry to pull the chemicals off the market. And, you know, in, in today's environment, when sustainability is growing in value for a lot of companies, chances are they're going to pull the product or pull the chemical and find a substitute, even in cases where it's not clear that whatever they substitute it with is necessarily better for the environment. Um, so I think that's, again, another drawback of disclosure is really kind of a misunderstanding of information that you put out there. Um, so let me give, talk about a couple of examples. I know we're supposed to be brief, um, of, uh, of uh, situations uh, in which the disclosure debate has played out um, in industry. One quick example is uh, the EPA Design for the Environment program. Uh, now, this is a program where EPA allows companies to place a label on their cleaning products, uh, and it actually, says e yeah, it actually says US EPA Design for the en Environment on it. And the way you get this label is you have to essentially show that each ingredient in your product is uh, among the least harmful ingredients within that ingredient class. So it would have to be uh, your surfactants would have to be the least harmful surfactants, your solvents would have to be the least harmful solvents, et cetera. Um, and, but in order to obtain this DS, DFE label, you have to fully disclose all your ingredients, both to EPA and either on your product label or on a website. So Walmart uh, 
which is, you know, a controversial company, recently announced that it's pursuing DFE labeling for all of its in-house cleaning products. So here's a, a pretty clear case where the company want, is pursuing a route where they believe in, an, in, in that their products are um, some of the most uh, environmentally sound out there, and they want the public to know it, and they don't mind, and they think it's in their benefit to have this information out there and available. Um, a second example, uh, which is, I think, a little more controversial, is in the, is in the fracking case. Uh, without getting into the state-by-state -state laws, there's been a lot of controversy around the Frack Focus website, which is the website that's the disclosure tool for uh, a lot of the st for both voluntary reporting and for mandatory state reporting. And the way it's painted uh, often is that the website is um, ineffective in disclosing a lot of types of information. And I think a lot of people like to point the finger at industry and say, well, industry is holding it back. Um, but I think if you look at the history of the evolution of Frack Focus, I think it's a very different story. So Frack Focus initially, before it became a tool for mandatory reporting, was a completely voluntary system that had been negotiated between essentially environmental groups, uh, including uh, one of the groups that actually runs the Frack Focus website, um, and, and industry. And industry. And the focus when the website was created was that people wanted to know what chemicals were being used in nearby wells, uh, near your home. So the way it's organized is you can look it up. You can look up essentially contents of fracking fluids on, uh, on a geographic basis. Uh, and industry and environmental groups set a set of milestones for voluntary disclosure. And I think industry is very happy. A lot of the in industrial fighting companies were happy and felt like they're, they're going ahead of the curve by voluntary, voluntarily disclosing what was in their fracking ingredients. Um, fast forward to, to today, and there's a lot of criticism, again, about it being an inadequate tool because it's just difficult to organize the information. Um, uh, and, and several other factors. It's treatment, it's treatment of trade secrets, for example. Uh, but I think l looking at the, the evolution of frack focus, again, as something where industry tried to voluntarily promote information rather than uh, uh, looking at it today as an inadequate tool really paints a different story of where industry was at and kind of the historical evolution of voluntary disclosure of fracking information. Um, so I'd just like to conclude by saying that you know, these issues, the balancing of trade secrets and uh, versus and, uh, you know, misunderstanding of information versus all the benefits of disclosure for, for companies are not that necessarily that easy to resolve. But I think there's plenty of room uh, to come to the table on issues like what, what's going on with the FRAC focus database um, and to come to an amicable, amicable resolution because it's not that industry has completely different values from the rest of society, I think there actually are a lot of shared values and uh, there's a large kind of zone of possible interest for us to figure out uh, the right level of disclosure and an effective level of disclosure in a variety of situations. Thank you. Thank you. What, what a well-disciplined panel, my goodness, I tell you. Five type A personality sticking to the time, that's great. So we're, we're at uh, a little bit beyond, we got started a little late with the organizer's permission. I'm, I'm gonna see if we can run this panel to at least about 10.35 or so, if that's okay with the bosses. Is that okay? Um, so thanks, Shai, for giving me the first question. So Matt, what's wrong with Frack Focus? Why isn't this <laughs> precisely the kind of private sector initiative we're looking for. Um, four things are wrong with Frack Focus. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, first of all, I, I will say um, Frack Focus as a voluntary effort is something that we very much support. I mean, I think that it was great that it was a voluntary effort. I think that our problems largely stem from the fact that the design of Frack Focus was based around a negotiation between these sort of interstate regulatory groups. Um, I'm not sure I would call them environmental groups and the oil and gas industry when they were developing a regime where 
that would sort of entice companies to voluntarily disclose on the website. Um, and I think that's a very different, um, the, the complaints that environmentalists have um, levied against frac focus are where it's used in a regulatory context. It's used um, by states that have adopted it as the location for disclosure of the fracking that goes on in that state. Um, so I think the things that are wrong with frac focus are, first of all, a sort of general issue around records retention and management. Um, this is a privately run website. Um, there are not the sort of same requirements for government records um, management that we might otherwise have. Companies can go in and change um, disclosures that they've made. There's no date stamp on there, so we, it's very difficult to tell whether companies reported on time. Um, they can change them subsequently. There was, for instance, a news article in um, one of the trade papers that showed that diesel had been used in a number of fracturing jobs, which um, based on looking at frac focus data, and diesel, as you may know, is not sort of subject to the Halliburton loophole or the exemption in the Safe Drinking Water Act, which means that if you use diesel in your frac job, theoretically, you are still subject to the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, and you would need a permit for that. Um, after it was reported that a bunch of these wells had used it, they were, um, a number of those disclosures no longer had diesel listed um, after we went to look at, at, you know, which wells those were and, and what report, what they had reported and what volume and so forth. So we don't know if that's, I mean, some of the companies claimed it was a mistake. We don't know. Um, you know, they could have just switched it over to trade secret. In many states, they can unilaterally determine that certain things are a trade secret. So there are, are concerns with that. There are concerns with aggregation of the data. Um, so FRAC Focus has made it very difficult to take data um, except by individual, they serve it up by individual PDFs. And they make it so you can't link to the data and that you can't aggregate it. Um, and it's theoretically against the terms of use of the website um, to try and figure out a way to to take it down and make it into a database. Um, so that's another big problem in terms of research on the effects of fracking that are going on across the country. Um, there are some concerns with accuracy um, in terms of does a state look at the data that's up on frac focus with the same um, eye that they would if it was submitted directly to the rate regulator. And we've seen that in a number of states, basic requirements of the rules just aren't being met. Um, when the disclosures are to frac focus. Um, That's and probably good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So 60 second response, Shai. Oh yeah, no problem. So, I mean, I, to the extent that there's shortcomings in the accuracy, accuracy of information on frac focus, I don't, I mean, I think there's plenty of room to try to, uh, industry's gonna wanna address those shortcomings too, right? You don't wanna be making, disclo making the effort of making disclosures uh, having it be wrong and get out there, or having it do nothing, right? You don't want to make a disclosure and have no one believe it anyway, right? And so I, I absolutely believe that to the extent there's inaccuracies and we can figure out a system, systematic way to fix them, then industry will be on board for that. I think some of the issues that you're mentioning um, are, are targeted at frac focus, but there's a question of whether it's frac focus or more rigorous state enforcement that's needed, I think. Right, because for uh, I think the frac, the frac focus people or the people who run it, I think would argue like, look, it's not our job to be doing all these kind of pseudo enforcement tasks. We just host a website. People give us information, we put it up there. The states want to figure out whether it's substantiated or not. They can do that, and you know, arguably, the states have the tools to go after false information. So then, I think the the next question then is, are we better off having a state by state regulatory program? Uh, where, you know, with a central repository, are we better off with a federal regulatory program? And I think that's a, that's a whole other debate we could have on the issue. Oh, and then I guess the final point on, on aggregation, I think, is that there's, again, the, the reason, the way this the site was originally designed was as a well by well kind of let me see what's in my neighboring site, which is, I think, why it originally didn't have those tools. Um, you know, I think, I, I'm not aware of the terms of service of the website, but you know, facts you can't copyright. So I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the trade-offs are of someone else actually pulling the data down and and, and making you know a web uh, a database based on the website. I can't imagine it'd be that much work. I mean, there's a few thousand docs on there, but you know. 
So any other panelists want to comment on this frack focus issue? Yeah, actually, I would like to jump in, and uh, I, I, I would come heavily in, on Matt's side on this one, and though Shah is actually from my province in India, <laughs> I have to uh, <laughs> differ with you, Shah. Uh, I think Matt just pointed out something really fundamental about disclosure, that disclosure has become so trendy and it's, it's so just accepted as a good thing that actually it has become quite easy to create a perception of disclosure. But there is a real difference between authentic disclosure and creating this perception. And from what Matt described, it looks like the site has too many problems. I mean, if it is a truly disclosure-oriented site, we have to have some of these nitty-gritty data issues that he pointed out has to be in place. We need to know so much about data, and that's why I made one of those points that many times countries have failed to succeed on disclosure is because they fail to create the institutional and organizational foundation for good data. And as a, uh, if I put on my regulatory hat, I mean, we po focus so much on data collection system. There has to be, it has to be, there is a protocol, there is a frequency, and if a site doesn't enable a researcher like Mark to go there and within five minutes download the data in a nice CSV file or some statistical format that he can throw into a regression model, it is not a disclosure-oriented site. So, you know, that's one point I would like to say about. And the other one is, Industries resist disclosure systematically, and voluntary disclosure, from my experience, has just not worked. So if disclosure is not bolstered by real hard laws and regulations and monitoring and disclosure and reporting protocols, it just doesn't work. That's you know, one fundamental finding. Is this an instance, uh, Shakeb, where the raw data disclosure is important? Um, The way I was thinking about this whole fracking discussion and, and, and I plan to write about it is it's at a very early stages in terms of the discovery process of how do we regulate it. And so, like in the case of the TRI, the first step is really we don't know what is being disclosed, what is out there. That was what John Muir wrote in, uh, before the TRI, that we don't even know what toxics are out there. Now, what is interesting in the case of the TRI was the expectation was that we let's start with the data collection process, and then it will ultimately lead to regulations and standards for these toxics. It has never happened. These toxics are just not regulated through a numerical standard. We are at the same stage with fracking, and what I believe that we should learn our lesson from the way the TRI has, we need to get a very rigorous system of data collection, not for disclosure, but just to get a solid raw data. and then. I'm not clear in my head whether it should be disclosed or it should be used between regulator and industries in that limited space to work out what's the best mode for you know, taking it to the next step. But there has to be a systematic method for reporting some of these chemicals, which doesn't exist right now at all. Mark, is greenwashing a big problem, and do you think the FTC guidelines are adequate? Well, greenwashing has always been a problem, and it will always continue to be. I mean, the FTC... Certainly, well, they're, they just updated the, the green marketing guidelines, and I think um, there's certainly an improvement cause, because they focus a little bit more on the current state of, of advertising. Um, but, but I think largely it, it's the same problem with any kind of disclosure, and it comes back to, I think, an awful lot of what we were just talking about in terms of credibility. Um, there needs to be some body, whether it's a, whether it's a voluntary or, or a regulatory. I mean, it, it, first of all, I want to step back for a second. We all could say, well, sure, we want information disclosure so that ultimately we could regulate. That's fine. Some would agree, some might not, might not agree. But we're also living in a world where we're not regulating like we used to. Okay, so let's, let's, let's step back and say, you know what, we may not regulate those, those toxic chemicals. We may not regulate fracking fluids. Uh, we're not in a political situation where that's likely to happen right now. So then you come back to disclosure, and the, and the question is, are, is there a credible disclosure mechanism? And this gets back to your, to your uh, marketing question. Um, are there credible bodies that, that, that consumers can go to, that communities can go to, and say, I, I'm, I'm, when I read this, I actually believe it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, I think, part of the problem with, with, with this discussion on frac focus, part of the discussion with, with, um, you know, with your, your question on advertising. So there needs to be monitors out there, whether they're government or 
private, they still need to be credible monitors. Katrina, what do you think about social media as a tool for getting at some of the disclosures you're talking about? You you see some opportunities? Is there an app for that? Boy, you've asked the wrong the wrong person. I, I just got rid of my clamshell. I don't know how to tweet. Um, but um, I have thought quite a bit about um, the intersection between technology and the development of more information about individual environmental behaviors and some of the privacy concerns that it raises. Um, absolutely, in the uh, there is. Um, I think an encouraging um, trend in environmental law where you see um, individuals, community groups, having access to technology and the means to distribute it in ways that is salient to local communities and individuals. So something that interests me is ways to get more fine-grained information to individuals about their local environment um, and also their impacts back on the environment. So I'm trying to think there's um, a group that goes around Brooklyn and actually does these little um, air monitoring around Brooklyn. And with the technology being what it is, they can do that. They can broadcast it. They can post it. Um, I think um, one difficulty, um, as great as that is, um, and that can be, um, ultimately, I think our our entire regulatory structure needs to take this um, more seriously um, because there's so much information out there. I think in part, um, one of the downsides of um, technology and the availability of information is there tends to be a self-selection in terms of interest. So who do you have as your audience? Well, you tend to attract the people who are already interested in, in that subject. There's this weird way in which technology, all of this information being available, tends to actually specialize us off into small segments and actually might uh, reify existing pockets of ignorance depending on pre-existing kind of interests, beliefs, um, ideologies, and the like. So I think if you're um, interested, if your goal is a broader awakening of the American public um, to how unsustainable our lifestyles are and the and, and I think this is incredibly important, the impacts that that has on our quality of life. Mm. Um, I, I think that it needs to be a more deliberate and more centralized approach um, in part to overcome label fatigue, to overcome the real um, sociological and psychological barriers to communicating information effectively to people, to understanding how they'll respond to it. Um, And I think it's um, one um, area where our environmental law and policy um, is lacking. Good. Well, let me uh, see if I can get some audience questions in here, because our time is running short. I got 50 more questions, but I'm going to stop. So come on up here. and Who would you like to ask a question of? Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Gary Durr. I live up in uh, Randolph, retired here. I was an engineer for 35 years. My question for Mark is you mentioned um, that there's limited quality monitoring of fracking. The most I know I, I hear about on 60 Minutes and programs like that. It seems like it is so important to the economic future of this country uh, in a position of strength, and if we can lead in monitoring and prove to the world we're doing it right, uh, we need to make it a priority. How can we make it a priority? I think that's for you, right? Is, is, is that Mark? Well, I think, well, I can take it, but I think it's more Matt, right? You've been a lateral. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I think we need the regulatory instruct- structures in place to do that um, at this point. Um, there, you know, I mean, I suppose there are some um, public-private partnerships. We haven't seen those come to fruition. There's something called the Center for Sustainable Shale Development that was just started by um, the Environmental Defense Fund and a few oil and gas companies that's sort of in the Marcellus area, and they are planning to sort of look and um, do um, they're, you know, they're trying to do a, a job of monitoring companies' operations on the ground and doing some kind of certification scheme. They haven't really mapped out exactly what that looks like. But, um, but I think that we need to have, you know, I think even they have said that's not a substitute for regulation, and we need to have the regulation in place to do this monitoring. Um, 
both in terms of um, you know the stuff that's going in the ground, but also in terms of air emissions. There've been there's been a huge debate around um, what are the methane emissions that um, come from fracking and oil and gas. Um, there are wide, widely ranging estimates about how much um, methane is leaking out of these wells and whether that totally erases, for instance, the climate benefits. Um, so I think we need we need a lot more study and we need regulators to get there. Um, and and let me, let me, in place. Let me just jump in for one second, since it was supposedly to me. But I want to say that that one similar type of thing that that I see, you see this in the oil and gas industry. I mean, following the BP spill, if you if you you know the the major companies, they're they're concerned about access to these resources. They're concerned about long term. If you talk to Exxon Mobil, who many people might think is you know the worst company in the world, when you talk to Exxon Mobil, they they have a 50, 60 year outlook. I mean, they do planning based on the price of carbon being sixty dollars a ton. They're, they're, you know, that's a completely forward-looking company because they're in this for the long haul. And so, you know, when you have this dichotomy of, and they're concerned about the wildcatters. They're concerned about somebody, a small person coming in who doesn't have the capital, who doesn't have the expertise, and who's looking to make a quick buck, and then ruining it for the entire industry. And so I think that's part of the thing with fracking, and it comes back to your question. And a lot of what's, what you see in fracking are these small wild, wildcatters who anybody can come in and, and do this. Um, and so the larger companies are probably looking, and I know they are, looking much more towards let's try to find a way where, where the industry is, in fact, supported by the public. And that's what they really want. Other questions? Hi, I'm Sandy Thompson. I spent 20 years in the environmental regulatory field and then in the last eight years in campaign finance. So disclosure is something that I'm very much interested in. But I just, looking back at, and this is directed more to Mark, with the TRI, um, the public understood that toxins weren't good. And I think when I look at the CO2, there's still such a debate. So it's almost like disclosure has to be timed and that brings in the public education. So if well, clearly you and, and one of the one of the concerns with using um, using CO two disclosure as a way as thinking that it will have that impact is exactly what you said. Um, you don't see the direct health impacts, it's another way to think of it. This is much more public good than than toxics is where you actually feel I'm living next to you know a facility, and I'm going to breathe that. If, and so, if I if I actually protest against it and reduce TRI emissions at that local plant, I'll actually see the benefits. And so, there is a much more personal, and I think it's much much harder. What this really gets to, I think, is is social norms. I mean, there is an awful you know, there's a lot of agreement by the public that that climate's an issue, that greenhouse gas is an issue, but it's not. We're not yet to the point where the social norms are to look for look for these these uh, you know less polluting ways. Well, I've just been given the hook, so uh, I think we're going to have to wrap this up. But it's not often we get this much talent in South Royalton, so I, I, I hope that you will take advantage of the fact that these folks are here with us for today and buttonhole them during the day and ask them follow-up questions. And in the meantime, thanks a lot for a really terrific panel. Thank you.